Americans and Latinos in the quest for social justice. Um, before we begin, I would like to thank our graduate assistant, she's not here currently because of class, um, Stephanie Guzman for her help in putting this project together, as well as our co-sponsors, the Levitt Center, Humanities Forum, the Philosophy Department, Brothers Organization, and Peter Canava, who can also not make it today because of an emergency. Um, on to the bio. Professor Laura Polito is, uh, teaches at American Studies and Ethnicity at the University of Southern California, where she studies and teaches race, political activism, critical human geography, and environmental justice. Recent books include Black, Brown, Yellow, and Left, a Radical Activism in Los Angeles, A People's Guide to Los Angeles, and Black and Brown in Los Angeles, Beyond Conflict and Cooperation. One of the gems about this particular position at the Dave's Masolo Center is that we get to bring esteemed authors and activists that we have read and that have impacted our way of thinking about resistance. And this topic, I believe, is so timely and richly important as we are in the belly in a new movement of activism and solidarity with your generation. So I am just beyond grateful that Professor Paluto has offered her time and expertise to address and interrogate this intercultural understanding. Please join me in welcoming Professor Laura Paluto. Thank you for that very generous introduction. And I don't want to embarrass you, but it's Pulido. <laughs> oh, it's okay, it's okay. It, it normally gets mangled and it doesn't phase me very much. It's okay. So thank you very much for inviting me to be here, Kimberly, and again, Stephanie, who is not here, but has been very instrumental um, for this whole event. Um, I've been asked to talk about a matter of great interest to me, the subject of relationships between communities of color, and in particular, between African American and Latinos. This is something that I've studied for a number of years, as well as something that also I've been politically active around for um, years. So it's something that I'm very, very passionate about. Now, relations between African Americans and Latinos, I think, are important for any number of different reasons that we could talk about today. Um, as of the year 2000, I'm sure most of you know, well, gosh, I guess it's 2000, you were just babies <laughs> at that point in time, most of you. <laughs> um, uh, so you probably don't remember when it happened, but you know of it, that Latinos became the largest minority group in the United States. Um, this was big for those of us who did live through this event <laughs> as adults. So one of the first questions that comes to my mind when we had this kind of demographic shift is, well, what does this mean for African Americans, who have kind of this, this demographic shift as well as the changes in the larger racial structure of the United States? Some, of, some observers focusing on demographics emphasize, have emphasized that Latinos are kind of the new growing political power and that African Americans, in order to be, remain relevant, have to be reaching out and engaging with, with Latino communities and activists. Others focus on the commonalities between the two groups. I know there's, within particularly the left and progressive circles, there's this kind of assumption or orientation that if only Latinos and African Americans could get their act together, unite, they could really you know, effectively challenge white supremacy. But you know, they just have like, like all these obstacles and challenges to really doing that kind of work. Still, others question Latinos' credentials as people of color. Well, clearly many Latinos um, identify as non-white and could never pass as white, others can, leaving an opening for a whole host of questions about the larger racial formation and the consequences for um, African Americans. I've done a bit of work around this um, in other projects around questions of racial identity and, and Latinos, and we really are beginning to see a very interesting kind of bifurcation in terms of Latinos, in terms of those who identify as white and then the non-white population. So I think that's an interesting trend that's going to be developing in the coming years and decades. Today, what I would like to do is I'd like to offer a slightly different way of thinking about relationships between African Americans and Latinos in the United States. Instead of just conceptualizing these groups as two, um, as two separate populations, I want to encourage us to think about the extent to which they produce each other, what we call relational ethnic studies. And that's really kind of moving away from the idea that these are two discrete static groups and begin to think about racial ethnic groups as processes, as always in flux, as being produced um, by structures and certainly by each other, okay? So what I first wanna do today is I wanna provide a bit of intellectual context by way of ethnic studies. Second, I want to outline two dominant schools of thought when we think about black and brown relations in particular competition and conflict. 
um, so, wait, competition and cooperation, excuse me. Third, then, I want to introduce the idea of relational ethnic studies, and then I'd like to present some findings on black-brown solidarity in the United States and present some examples from environmental justice. So I'd like to begin by locating the study of African Americans and Latinos within ethnic studies. Certainly other disciplines also study these groups, such as sociology, history, literature, and so on, but the impetus for such an analysis really comes from ethnic studies, I believe. As many of you may know, ethnic studies um, really begins in the late 1960s here in the United States, although we could point to early predecessors of uh, antecedents of, of the discipline. And it really develops in response to students' demands for a relevant education, right? Students of color wanted to learn about their own history and experiences. Thus, we get the rise of African American studies, Asian American studies, Chicano studies, Native American studies, Puerto Rican studies, and it's continuing to evolve today. I know there's lots of talk now about Arab American studies, right, as joining kind of the pantheon of, of ethnic studies um, uh, uh, disciplines. And it's very important to note that these demands were articulated as distinct disciplines. People wanted Chicano studies. People wanted native studies, as it were. But the struggles for these disciplines were not distinct. They were very much mass-based movements of students coming together and fighting with each other for these different kinds of programs, for these different kinds of departments, and for the birth of these disciplines. So it's interesting that there were these distinctions, but yet they very much were a vibrant movement of people coming together and working with each other. Now these various disciplines of ethnic studies grew over the next 30 years or so for a period of time, and they produced knowledge on the experiences of communities of color, which were largely missing up until that time. They began to challenge the deeply racist thinking of the academy. We were able to begin retelling our histories and stories from our point of view, not from that of white people. Nevertheless, within ethnic studies, the point of comparison, for the most part in the early stage, was always white people and whiteness. So for example, how does educational attainment among black students compare to that of whites? Whites were kind of like the norm. How does Latino household income uh, compare to that of whites? Whites were seen as the norm and as a source of racial and economic oppression. But in the 1990s, ethnic studies scholars began to wonder, hmm, I wonder how we vary more within each other. So for example, how might, the, how might the Chicano experience in terms of education vary from the Japanese American one? I remember actually when I was a grad student at UCLA in the late 70s, I had a friend in sociology who was Japanese, who was thinking to myself, gee, I want to study that. I'm thinking to myself, boy, what a study that would be, Japanese Americans versus Mexicans, right? <laughs> and he really struggled and wanted to do it, but there actually wasn't an infrastructure at that time to help him do that kind of study. So we had to study something else. Um, but he eventually was able to come back to some of those issues once more work had been developed in that area. So in the beginning, in the 90s then, scholars, they began thinking about these questions and then we get the development of comparative ethnic studies, which I know some of you are familiar with here in this room. So since this time, scholars have been producing a rich body of knowledge that examines the experiences of people of color in relationship to each other. <coughs> as well, of course, in relationship to whites and to white supremacy. Now, comparative ethnic studies not only examines, for example, differential educational outcomes for all groups, but also how these different groups are racialized, how they experience racism in distinct kinds of ways, and how we may contribute to the racial subordination of each other, right, especially under conditions of white supremacy. And, and this is in no way, I think, meant to take away from or erase uh, or detract from the power of white racism and white supremacy. I think we're just at a stage now where we're able to begin asking these questions amongst each other, all right? And again, that's not something that was conceivable, you know, 30, 40 years ago. It was just really focused on, uh, on, on whites. So I think it's really a, a signal about where the academy is, where the disciplines are, where political movements are that we can be having these kind of conversations in the first place. So this is kind of the general intellectual context um, for the study, I think, of Latinos and African Americans. 
Now within the study of African Americans and Latinos, which is probably one of the most robust sites of study within comparative ethnic studies, there are two primary schools of thought. And those are competition and cooperation. And I'm gonna discuss each of them briefly. So first one, competition. As the name suggests, this refers to the idea that Latinos and African Americans, as the two leading minority groups in the United States, are competing with each other. What are they competing about? They're competing for political power. They're competing for jobs. They're competing for limited state resources. They're competing for the respect, especially respect of white people. They're competing for membership in the nation. They're competing about who is the most aggrieved. They're competing about who is the leader of the civil rights movement. Have all of you guys heard these kinds of things before? To not be totally, I mean, it's, it's in the air, this kind of discourse and talking about this. Oh, it happened. I keep getting this thing on my computer. My I do too. You do too? It's like, how do you turn it off? Oh, turn off your, uh, the Wi-Fi. Do you need the Wi-Fi? Uh, okay. Uh, no, I don't need the Wi-Fi. Yeah. How, how do I do that? <laughs> <laughs> Click on the little Wi-Fi thing. That'll turn it on. Oh, I have to get out of here altogether. Yeah. Okay. So you see just truly how technologically challenged I am. Okay. Oh, there we go. All right. Thank you. I just always leave it on, so I never think to turn that off. <coughs> All right. Cool. Forget about. Um, what was I? All right. So much of the competition argument, I think, is rooted in demographics, all right? Now, historically, African Americans, of course, have been the largest racial group and minority group in the United States. And consequently, they have attracted a great deal more attention over time. And now Latinos are the largest group that we can talk about. To give you an idea of what this change has looked like in terms of, of you know, population demographics, I want to show you two, some maps from Los Angeles, of course. The I, I noticed when you said in your introduction to me, it's like, that's all she studies is LA. <laughs> um, but they're, they're two really powerful maps, and I think these really are just kind of emblematic of what's happened in the larger United States. So this first map here, over here, this shows us the distribution of African Americans in LA and Orange County in 1970, okay? They look a little weird, they got stretched out. All right, this shows us the distribution of Latinos in LA and Orange County in 1970. And I don't know if you can tell it or not, but these are actually two comparable populations in terms of size. They are comparable populations in 1970, okay? 2000, all right? Here we have the African American population in 2000, and we have the Latino population in 2000 in LA and Orange County, all right? So for um, African Americans, they actually at this point are registering slight decreases in total population, although they're slightly more dispersed now as there's been some decrease in residential segregation and discrimination. Uh, but Latinos have just exploded over the map, right? So there's like huge levels of increase in the Latino population. Now, other places are different from Los Angeles because they didn't start with a large Latino population the way LA does, and so they don't have the huge numbers that LA, LA does. But the percentage change is just as great, if not greater, in other parts of the United States particularly the Southeast, which has experienced the largest expansion of the Latino population because you were starting with zero basically there you know, several decades ago. So it's been huge kinds of changes that we are talking about, very rapid dynamic kind of increase in the Latino population. Now some refer to this demographic change as the Latino tsunami in the words of Vaca, Nicholas Vaca, or the browning of America. Just a few weeks ago, The Economist had a special issue focused on Latinos, right? Um, and this is similar to like Time and Newsweek, all of which have done specials on you know this new phenomena. And this is like their lead article. Oh, you can't even. Oh, what what is going on here? With oh wait, let me try doing it on. Um, no, I don't know what to do. Oh well, they look weird. Let's wait it. Um, no, go back. All right. The uh, article, uh, the name of the lead article up here says, from minor to major, what does this mean for America, right? So it's this big question, actually. What does it mean now that Latinos are such a large part of the population, something that we have to devote a special issue to? Now, critics 
critics of this approach call this demographic determinism, right? And they say, just because you have the numbers does not mean that you're destined to dominate. And I think that this is very true. Most people would argue that uh, the dominant role of African Americans in US society, in particular in terms of race relations, is not only due to its historic size, but also the centrality of the black experience, which has been very fundamental from the beginning of this country, as it has also for Native peoples, one would argue. In contrast, the Latino experience, if you can call it that, some would dispute that, is much more regional, historically has been much more regional and much more diverse, right? It's only within the last 20 years, in fact, that we talk about the Latino experience. Um, before that, it was Mexicans, Puerto Ricans, Cubans, and then we got more uh, South, South uh, uh, Central Americans, Dominicans, South Americans. And so people talk about now this Latino experience, but when I went to school and grew up, that didn't exist. It was just Mexicans, right? That's what there was in the southwestern United States. And you know, I remember we had a neighbor from Argentina, and it was like, oh wow, there's like some different, you know. <laughs> we didn't necessarily see a, a feel a kinship with these people um, in, in any way. And that, that's changing, I think, and in important ways today. Now, it's important to understand that it is precisely the centrality of the black experience that has also led to competition. Latinos often feel and resent that they, they're in the shadow of African Americans. The black experience often defines things, and Latinos are somehow expected to fit into those particular kinds of frameworks that have been developed, right? Here, police violence. Uh, is seen through a black lens and extrapolated onto the Latino population. Now, closely related to conflict, but distinct from it, it wait, sorry, closely related to competition, but distinct from it is conflict, all right? And sometimes conflict stems from competition, but not always. For example, there is increasing research that we have that shows evidence that some Latinos have very strong anti-black feelings. They have exhibited hostility towards African Americans, not because they're in competition with them, but because they wish to distance themselves from African Americans. <coughs> they perceive black people to be at the bottom of the racial hierarchy, and they don't want to be lumped in the same category. For example, throughout much of the 20th century, Lula, the uh, League of United Latin American Citizens, which was an early civil rights organization here in the US, LULAC leaders have repeatedly rejected efforts to categorize themselves as colored or non-white. They actually took this to court to fight it, refusing to be called that. Instead, these Latinos insisted, they were mostly Mexican, I should say, insisted that they were white and therefore subject to all the privileges of white people. So instead of challenging racial hierarchy, right, in the first place, these people instead have bought into white supremacy in order to improve their own situation while further subordinating black people, all right? These are efforts that hardly inspire solidarity on the part of African Americans and Latinos when you have those kinds of politics. Now the flip side of the conflict competition school of thought is those who stress solidarity and cooperation. These scholars point to the long history of solidarity between the two groups, especially between Mexicans, of which we can trace back to the 1800s, when Mexico, for example, offered a safe haven to black slaves. Oh my gosh. <laughs> That's terrible looking. Oh, I can read it from here, though. Um, so this is from Ron Wilkins. I don't know if any of you know some of his work, who's done a lot of work on black Mexicans in, in Mexico, as well as in the United States, and he writes here, the slave institution in Texas was continuously undermined by defiant Tejanos who took great risks and invested enormous resources towards facilitating the escape of enslaved Africans. The Texas to Mexico routes to freedom constituted major unacknowledged extensions of the Underground Railroad. Tejanos were variously accused of, quote, tampering with slave property and stirring up among the slave population, quote, a spirit of insubordination. So this has been a very important, I think, and understudied um, topic, actually, looking at these kinds of, of connections here. One of the most developed parts of this literature pertains to culture, especially music. There have been a number of studies showing the musical connections between African American and Latino artists. We can see this in the cross currents of hip hop. We can see it in completely new formations, like Ozo Motley, 
as well as in historical musical scenes, such as the R&B scene in 1950s Los Angeles that brought brown and black youth together. Other scholars point to moments of solidarity. Um, one of the most well-known being the solidarity between the Black Panthers, the Chicano uh, Brown Beret, and the Puerto Rican Young Lord. Now, while it is essential to know this history, I also think it can sometimes be greatly overblown, this his these histories of solidarity. First of all, just because people collaborate in music does not necessarily translate into political movements and a set of demands. Indeed, George Lipsitz has described cultural sharing as a dress rehearsal, he says, for political activism. It can prepare people for political activism, but it is not necessarily the same thing. In addition, I think sometimes this literature often overlooks the very real tensions and differences that do exist between these groups, all right? There can be structural differences in their economic positions, in terms of placement in the racial hierarchy, as I have alluded to, as well as in terms of the nation, right? We have seen during anti-immigrant campaign, campaigns, some African Americans really speak out in very strong terms against undocumented immigration and against immigrants altogether. And for many people, they see this as a chance where African Americans are finally invited to be part of the nation, right? So white groups, anti-immigrants are extending invitation, hey, you too come and join our, our club, right, in terms of opposing um, Latinos and employs, impo uh, opposing immigration. So there's, I think there's a very real tension that we don't, can't pretend like they don't exist and just gloss over them by stressing the solidarity. Those have to be dealt with in very frank and difficult conversations and recognizing, well, we will have points of connection. Sometimes we may have different disagreements, right? And how do we learn to live with those disagreements and still move on where we are able to make some progress? Now, the final approach I wish to discuss is relational ethnic studies. Instead of focusing on the differences and similarities between the two groups, relational ethnic studies study, uh, focuses on how various groups produce each other. Just as Latinos and African Americans are partly produced by white racism, so too are they produced by other people of color. So for example here, this is an example of Jim Crow, this is actually from Texas, from, from Denning, Texas, right? So when you have things like Jim Crow, that obviously has profound implications for the groups that are being targeted and are being addressed, right? This shapes them, this shapes their experiences, their memories, their consciousness, how they will respond to these forms of oppression and domination. Now we need to start looking at each other, right, and what is happening in terms of these different kinds of practices. Because we too produce conditions, events, and discourses that affect other groups and that they react to. Through that process, we define ourselves and our experiences, as well as for each other. <coughs> now, in writing about California, um, Gay Johnson has, has written here, cultural and historical studies have been written to reflect discrete racial and cultural categories, making the state appear as if it, it is a space inhabited by individualized, distinct groups. This is an inaccurate portrayal of California as a cultural and social space. Labor, racial, and educational policies, as well as cultural practices, have resulted in both inter-ethnic antagonisms and a rich history of intercultural interaction. Recasting California in this way illumines a dynamic legacy of conflict and cooperation, one which gives us a history to draw from. Now, while Johnson is writing about California, I think the same is true for the United States as a whole, although there are important regional differences, certainly, that one could talk about. Now, there's many ways to think about, I think, hybridity and relationality. I focus on political activism. I am interested in how brown and black communities have shaped each other through their political struggles and social movements. And I start this particular part of the discussion by focusing on political consciousness. Now, political consciousness um, is incredibly important because I really see it as the precondition for uh, focus concentrated activism. You can't do that without having some level of political consciousness. It is true, some people may be like caught up in events, right? Maybe someone without thinking like, oh yeah, I'll go join the protest around Ferguson. Through that process then you may become, uh, you may develop a political consciousness, you may become politicized. 
but you really cannot embark on a larger strategy to try to change society, change the world without some level of political consciousness. That's kind of like the starting point for these kinds of things. When we're talking about political consciousness, we're talking about such things as how do people become aware of injustices? How do they interpret them? Why do, what do they, who do they see as the responsible parties? What are their proposed solutions? How and why do individuals come to believe that they should publicly act? How do they make the transition from a private individual to a public activist? Now, John Marquez has argues that Latinos' oppositional political consciousness draws heavily from the black experience. He developed the concept foundational blackness to refer to the process uh, by which Latinos absorb a black political consciousness. Come and sit down. <laughs> Now, I agree with Marquez that this happens quite a bit. But foundational blackness, I think, overlooks the fact that this can also be a two-way street. And in order to better understand this dynamic, I went ahead and I made a list of all the different instances of radical black political, radical political solidarity I could find between Latinos and African Americans. And I have mapped them out, which I'll show you in a few minutes. In making this list, I identified 150 instances of cross-ethnic solidarity between African Americans and Latinos from 1900 until 1914. Now, this is not a comprehensive list that I developed of black-brown solidarity. I did not, for example, include electoral campaigns for a variety of reasons, but primarily because I don't see electoral campaigns as being necessarily radical forms of oppositional politics, with the one exception of Jesse Jackson's <coughs> 1980 campaign, which I thought, if you lived through that, was pretty remarkable. <laughs> Um, nor do I include religious or community service. Um, well, while these are also may contain some levels of consciousness, they are not necessarily oppositional forms of engagement. I am interested in moments and in instances when people said, hey, let's change the power structure, all right? Let's systematically challenge economic relations, racism, and sources of domination. This is not necessarily the same thing as feeding homeless people, all right? Feeding, that's nothing wrong with feeding homeless people. It's a really good thing. Hope you all do it. But that is not necessarily oppositional politics. Do you understand the difference? That's a form of community service, you know, very different kinds of things that we're talking about. So I'm focusing on very explicit, overt forms of oppositional struggle. When a clear, conscious decision was made to cross a racial ethnic line and engage with the other group. Now, activists often cross lines because power can be generated through solidarity. It's a total bomb, <laughs> my pictures. Uh, but that is not the only reason that people may engage in this kind of solidarity. Sometimes activists seek to assist another ethnic and racial group because out of empathy. We saw this, for example, in 2001, when Japanese Americans spoke out against the racial profiling of, uh, towards Arab Americans and Muslims in the wake of 9-11. Sometimes it's a sense of moral outrage that different groups uh, ex uh, uh, feel like they really are, this is wrong, it's not right, and we need to speak up around this, right? And we can see this, for example, in the case of both Mexicans and Native American communities who assisted countless black slaves who were escaping. Now, when you start making these kinds of connections, it becomes increasingly messy and difficult to say where does Latino activism uh, end and where does African American activism start, right? They become increasingly blurred together. And this is where we really begin to see how black and brown people can produce each other. Now, I'd like to uh, begin talking about these particular kinds of sites by talking about one of the excluded things, something that is not on my list. And that is solidarity rooted in partial consciousness. I just went on and around about how important it is. I'm talking about ones that are based in full consciousness. But I really want to talk about partial consciousness first, which I think is really very important. Now, it's much harder to chart unconscious solidarity and action, which is one of the reasons why I did not do it, all right? It, it's very hard to do. But actually, these kinds of partial consciousness forms of connection are incredibly important and widespread. And I'm sure they're all familiar with some examples um, of them. Quoting Jay Go Kate Johnson once again, one of my good friends, she, she writes here, um, this is about Los Angeles, black and brown communities have consistently envisioned futures that include each other's memories and histories, even
even when it wasn't always a conscious choice. And I think this is incredibly true, and I wanna give you some examples of this, all right? Thinking through the whole business of consciousness and c conscious and unconscious sharing and solidarity can happen in numerous kinds of ways. Sometimes we are influenced and inspired by the actions of another. Other times, without any coordination, racial ethnic groups work to create conditions that support each other's struggles. This particularly, I think, oftentimes happens when communities are in, embedded in uh, structurally similar conditions, right? So they're responding to similar kinds of problems. Police abuse would be a good example, and I do see parallels and identity uh, parallels between uh, uh, Latino police violence and what happens to African Americans. Not exactly the same, but but strong parallels I think can be discerned in that regard. Oftentimes, groups share uh, create a shared ideological space that prepares people for more formal acts of protest and opposition. One example of this would be the Zoot Suit, all right, from the 1940s. Now, when I grew up, I used to think that this was a strictly a Chicano thing. I thought this is one of my people's great contributions to fashion, right? Um, but I then learned that actually African Americans and Filipinos, and who knows who else also, might have also, were also wearing the zoot suit, okay? Um, they all borrowed the zoot suit as a form of a statement of opposition, all right? And the most famous person to wear the zoot suit wasn't a Mexican, of course, but was <laughs> Malcolm X, all right? Um, he has a the whole discussion in this about in his, you know, the, or the autobiography of Malcolm X about him and the zoot suit. The suit was clearly a sign of opposition to the dominant society. It was this, the, the appearance of it, but also the amount of fabric that it takes. This is during wartime and cloth is being rationed. And so for the people then to use in this, this much cloth in making a suit was a very oppositional and unpopular decision uh, as seen by the dominant society. So for Malcolm X, the suit was a precursor to his life as a hustler, which of course ultimately leads him to prison, which ultimately leads to his political awakening. So in some ways, one could begin to see the possibility of Chicano consciousness and identity influencing the development of Malcolm X, although certainly never intended or conscious in any kind of way. In my own personal experience, I know, um, I've been greatly influenced by the black consciousness and black experience. I was born in 1962, and at that time, Mex in Los Angeles, and at that time, Mexicans were still very much considered to be a small regional minority, all right, and very much unlike today. I quickly learned as a child growing up that Mexicans were considered to be dumb, lazy, and incapable of mobilizing to improve their economic and political situation. People actually would say, oh, well, they're happy that way, the Mexicans being poor. They don't need or want more money, right? Um, as a child, I had no sense because there was no ethnic studies, of Chicano or Mexicano struggle and opposition. The Mexican Revolution was presented to me as solely a violent affair, not as one rooted in a people's struggle for justice and autonomy. But I was aware of what black people were doing. I saw it on TV, I heard it on the radio, I read it in the newspaper, and even it was talked about just a little bit in school at that time when I was growing up. When I was in second grade, my mom took me to the library and I checked out a book, I have no idea why, on Harriet Tubman. She was and remains my hero. I could not understand as a child how anyone could have the courage to do what she did. And in fact, it was my, de my desire to understand uh, such activism that led me to study political activism for the last 30 years, trying to grapple with that, what she did, and as I would sub sub subsequently learn what other people did too in similar kinds of situations, right? Thus in a completely unconscious way, my political consciousness and I, my identity as a Chicana was partially safe, shaped by what Cedric Robinson calls the black radicals tradition. Now we can identify at least four different positions based on awareness and deliberate, deliberation. First, we have partial consciousness, which I have just talked about. Second, we have borrowing, all right? A conscious borrowing from another group. And there's lots of examples of this today. This is from the, um, the recent Freedom Rise by immigrant rights activists, which draw very deliberately and directly from the civil rights movement, from the Freedom Riders, when they were fighting for voting rights in the South. And this was a very um, um, interesting kind of example what they were doing, kind of appropriating the language and uh, modes of activism from the civil rights 
um, uh, history. And they also incorporated a lot of African American um, activists, leaders, and sites within their itinerary <laughs> when they were making their, uh, their journeys. But they also faced some level of opposition with some African Americans saying, no, they're appropriating our history. It's not for them to use, we own it, right? So there was very interesting kind of politics around that that developed. And well, some African Americans <coughs> also pointing out, well, um, the problem isn't really that they're borrowing it, but the problem is that this implies that our struggle is over, and it's not, right? We still have all these an unfinished agenda that we're looking, uh, working for. So you could feel the, uh, the, the anxiety, right? The question about being displaced very, uh, very really around these particular kinds of, of activities that, that are happening here. The third kind we can talk about is conscious collaboration, all right? Conscious decisions that recognize the other as a political subject and possible ally. This is the recognition that working together, we can assist each other. And a good example of this can be seen between, for example, the UFW and the Black Panther Party, as well as the UFW and SNCC. They did a lot of work together. The organizations made formal agreements to assist each other. In the case of the Black Panther Party, they worked and helped the, uh, the UFW in terms of their boycotts, particularly over in the Bay Area, the San Francisco Bay Area. And the UFW went door to door knocking in support of Bobby Seale when he was running for mayor of Oakland, right? So very real forms of solidarity and exchange that they were involved in. Also with SNCC and the UFW, the SNCC, SNCC thought what UFW doing was so important, they actually let them organizers that were on SNCC payroll, they said, here, go over here, and we're gonna put you here for six months, nine months, help these people start their boycott. They don't know what they're doing. <laughs> and so they did. They came, they provided all kinds of leadership and tangible supports, walkie-talkies and things like that to help get the boycott um, off the ground. And then the last kind of category we can talk about are multiracial organizations, all right? Multiracial organizations. And I have this listing in terms of like levels of consciousness and awareness. I don't mean to imply that one is better than the other. There are just four different ones that we can see on a continuum of, of, of possible deliberation, okay? It's not that they're, one is better. Now, in terms of multiracial organizations, these, I think, typically develop, they could develop after a history of formal collaboration, right? From number three moving to number four, or it could be a next generation project that we see in terms of multiracial organizing. In my book, <coughs> Black, Brown, Yellow, and Left, um, I found that almost all of the explicitly multiracial organizations that, that existed in Los Angeles in the contemporary period had their roots in the 1970s. All right, from an earlier point in time, they had their roots. And in many cases, activists saw the limitations of a single, a single a uh, racial group trying to mobilize around a particular set of issues. And they realized there'd be much more power and possibility by linking up, by becoming multiracial, right? Those kinds of possibilities. And so that became very pop popular in places like Los Angeles in the 1980s and 90s. And a good example of this is the Bus Riders Union. Um, these are the people they went on to sue, I don't know if any of you know, they sued the local Metropolitan Transit Authority, arguing that the MTA was running two separate transportation systems that were separate and unequal, and they won. Uh, mm -hmm. They were the one very powerful kind of um, uh, uh, a case um, around this. Now, in this case, when they reached out in Los Angeles, because of large immigrant population, you really are dealing with questions of language become really important. So instead of seeing language as barriers, they kind of really just, they worked with people. It was not an easy thing to do. I don't want to pretend like it was. But they worked and developed a culture and identity. Yeah, we translate. We are the translators. So they were able to bring that together and make that one of the defining marks and a point of strength for multiracial organizing, all right, which is these are the people who ride the bus. They are Latinos, Spanish and English speakers, they're African Americans and Korean, and they actually are Chinese too, but they're not in this um, slide or they weren't, they have a, a, a different role in terms of geography and stuff like that in terms of the mobilizing that went on. So it was a very interesting example about how they, they came together. And also to talk about, again, the, the loops and historical loops that when we look about the BRU, this is part of an organization called the Labor Community Strategy Center, which came out of another organization called the GM Van Nuys, which was an effort of both uh, a multiracial workers organization to keep the GM Van Nuys plant open um, when the GM threatened to leave, which in turn came out of organizers working out of SNCC. 
All right, so again, layers and layers of history and evolution, people learning and always trying to like, how can we do it better? What do we gotta do now? How are the situations changed and how are we gonna respond to these uh, historical times that we are living in? So I want you to bear these ideas in mind as we go through and look at some of the uh, different kinds of organizing and activism that's happening um, based, on, based on the map. So this map here shows you um, uh, the distribution of points of radical solidarity from 1900 to 2014. The bigger the circle, the greater the number of events. Um, the biggest circles, which are New York City, LA, and San Francisco, those, are talk those represent eight, anywhere from 10 to 20 events that we're talking about, all right? Organizations uh, uh, coming together for, in various kinds of ways. Then the smaller ones, I think like seven to eight, five to six, and so on and so forth, okay? When you're looking at this. And you'll also notice the green lines that are moving across the maps, right? Um, and these are, um, these are rides that I could not pinpoint in any one place, all right? Um, they are, by definition, a ride is a mobile form of protest, all right? I've already mentioned the Immigrant uh, Workers Freedom Ride, but there's also been the New American, uh, New American Freedom Summer. There's been the Undocu Bus. So these have been different kinds of rides, again, all of which draw very heavily on the civil rights movement. Now, one of the things that quickly stands out in when you look at the maps is the importance of big cities, right? New York, LA, San Francisco. I'm sorry, Clinton or Hamilton isn't on the map. <laughs> Maybe it will be in a few years. Um, it's really in urban areas where this kind of intense cross-fertilization is taking place. It's in cities where people are living relatively close proximity to each other, that they are aware of what the other group is doing, and they're often in structurally similar kinds of position. And this greatly facilitates the possibilities of collaboration and solidarity. Regional culture is also very important. And clearly, California leads the way in this regard. This is a function not only of the demographics of California, it has large African American and Latino people, lo lots of numbers just to begin with, right? But it also has a particular kind of political culture, all right? And you can see this when you compare California and Texas, all right? It's two very different places. Texas also has a lot of people, large uh, black and brown communities, and lots of big cities. <coughs> but it doesn't begin to compare to the level of multiracial organizing, across solidarity organizing that we see in places like California. And that's because Texas has a much more conservative political culture. It was part of the Confederacy, right? Consequently, Latinos in, um, in Texas, like LULAC, which is primarily based in Texas, they've been much more likely to buy into white supremacy rather than to challenge it, all right? We have lots of examples of it um, that don't happen in California, where they develop, activists develop a very different kind of strategy. I've also divided up the events uh, by era for the three big cities, the three <coughs> primary ones, um, to see how they've changed a little bit over time, which I'm gonna talk a little bit about. Um, this one is, shows us New York City, uh, New York City. Um, and the red are, are um, moments of collaboration from 1900 to 64. The white is 64 to 79, and the green is 79, or 80 to the present, all right? So one of the clear things that you can see here in New York is this gr slow movement towards more uh, interracial solidarity and collaboration between the two groups in New York. One of the other things that I'm gonna come back to for a moment in this list, which you cannot read, of the green ones here, about half of them are related to environmental justice. About half of them, right? So really powerful. Here in California, um, like up in the Bay Area, we see no red in the Bay Area, all right? And again, that reflects the demographics of the time. Um, uh, there's a, a historically been a relatively very small Latino population in San Francisco, the Bay Area, uh, especially compared to African Americans. It's only in the last 20 years where there's been significant numbers of Latinos moving into that area, 20, 30 years. Well, San Francisco is a completely different story here, right? Again, because of the large numbers of Mexicans, demographic uh, you know, comparability for uh, a large portion of the time. So we see the red here early on, um, up to 64. We see the white during like the uh, civil rights, black, brown power movements. And then we see the green in the more contemporary period. I want to um, then talk a little bit about um, one story from this early time and then move on to environmental justice. Um, 
And as I want to talk about a really important case, and that is Mendes versus Westminster, which some of you may be familiar with. Now, um, this was a very famous court case <coughs> centered on school segregation. And it was based in Orange County, which is just adjacent to LA County, so Southern California area. And in um, LA, well, in California, everywhere really, Mexican children were segregated. School districts justified this by saying, Mexicans didn't speak English, so we need to put them in separate schools. In 1943, a group of parents sued. The judge said, well, if you're segregating on the basis of language, well then, don't you have to see what language people speak? <laughs> Something the school had not done. Um, so they said, the judge said, you have to give them a language test. The school board did not like that because the school board was not discriminating on the basis of language. They just didn't want Mexicans with the white kids. And they actually kept the Japanese kids separate too, actually, I should say. Um, and so the school board appealed the decision. And the appeal attracted significant attention. It included amicus briefs from the NAACP, the Japanese American Citizens League, the ACLU, the American Jewish Congress, among other organizations. Now at this time, black civil rights groups were not focused on desegregation. They were focused on trying to provide more equitable education for black students and black schools. And this is because the courts had consistently ruled that racial segregation was perfectly legal. All right, So it's kind of like hitting your head up against the wall. That's not going to work, us going against that logic. But in Westminster, Mendes versus Westminster, what they did is they challenged the principle of segregation itself, all right? The NAACP thought it was so important, they sent Thurgood Marshall to argue its position before the court. <coughs> and the court upheld the, that earlier decision, which made segregation illegal, all right, because it denied Mexican children equal protection under the 14th Amendment. This was the first major blow to legal segregation in the United States and ultimately, or at least in schooling, and ultimately leads to the desegregation of all of California schools and also sets the stage for Brown versus Board of Ed. Robert Carter, an NAACP attorney, described Mendes as, quote, a dry run for the future. Thus, you can't fully understand Brown without understanding Mendes. And you can't fully understand Mendes without acknowledging the NAACP as well as the Japanese American Citizens League, American Jewish Congress, and lots of other white folks. So this is what I mean of talking about the historical loops that we're talking about, right? And the difficulty of trying to, the ficti fictitious nature of trying to create these separate kinds of histories of activism um, between these various populations. Now I'd like to jump to the contemporary period and focus on instances of radical solidarity um, from 1980 to the present. And what is interesting to me is that the vast majority, about three quarters of places that I found across the country, are really environmental justice um, organizations and forms of activism. Um, <clears throat> so this obviously raises the question, what is it about EJ or environmental justice that seems to inspire such, so much cross-racial activism? Does everyone know what environmental justice is? Yes. No. 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 no, okay, thank you. <laughs> So in general, um, it, refers, uh, it refers to struggles against the disproportionate exposure of people of color and poor people to pollution and hazardous land uses. But it also refers more generally to environmental struggles in <coughs> these communities. And this became a very big issue in the 1980s and 90s and continues to be today. This is Warren County, North Carolina, and this is considered in many ways to be one of the birthplaces of the environmental justice movement, okay? Uh, what, the birthplaces of the environmental justice movement. And what these people are doing, they're using their bodies to block trucks that are coming, and these trucks were gonna dump PCB-laced soil on the side of the road in Warren County. I mean, just outrageous kind of stuff, right? So this begins this kind of mobilization around environmental justice issues. So, what is going on here in terms of EJ cross solidarity? I think the politics of space have a lot to do with this. As communities of color, they began realizing that they were often being targeted for polluting facilities. So the question was raised. Well, if we don't put the incinerator, for example, in the Puerto Rican community, maybe then we can put it in the black community. To which EJ activists said, no, we don't want it in any community, right? That's not right, all right? That sense of moral outrage. It's not what we're aiming for just to protect ourselves. We want a change. In fact, we want a change in the production system so we're not producing those same levels of waste and pollution as has has been the case. 
Thus, what could have pitted communities against each other, all right, go ahead and put in their communities, did not work. Instead, it became a very different situation and triggered solidarity for these various kinds of communities. Activists and organizers quickly saw the spatial dimensions of the problem, and they saw how individual communities were responding. And eventually then, what they decided to do is they decided to formalize by creating a series of networks across the United States, and now we even have them globally as well. Now, these networks are composed of multiple um, environmental justice organizations. Um, what am I missing a slide here? Oh, well. Um, they compose of multiple um, different organizations, many of which are of the same ethnic group, but together then they become and form a very powerful form of multiracial collaboration and organizing that goes on. Now, I want to give you a specific example, again from LA, sorry, <laughs> about this so you can get a better sense about how it works. In the 1980s, the city of Los Angeles was dealing with a major trash problem. And it was decided to develop a series of incinerators to deal with our trash, all right? Eight incinerators were planned for across the city, but of course the first one was slated for South LA, all right? So the city goes about doing this, they don't tell anybody, but of course a group of uh, residents find out, a group of women, and they begin mobilizing. And they call themselves Concerned Citizens of South Central Los Angeles. And working with students from UCLA, they successfully challenged the environmental impact report. And they point out that the original EIR overlooked both dioxin and fly ash, which would be contaminating the local community. Um, and eventually, Judge Arules agreed with them, and they were able to defeat the incinerator. And in fact, they got the city to reject the whole plan for, uh, for incineration, which was a really huge movement for LA, as well as for the environmental justice movement as a whole. Concerned citizens, to their credit, they recognized, well, we still have a trash problem. But they finally also got the city to adopt a recycling plan. Our first one in the city of LA ever was due to concerned citizens. Now, no sooner had uh, this, the activists had a chance to savor this victory when a plan was announced to build another incinerator in the city of Vernon, all right? Now, Vernon is right next to the city of Los Angeles. It abuts against the east side, Boyle Heights, um, which is part of the largest expanse of Latinos you'll find anywhere outside of Mexico. Uh, primarily, primarily Mexican. This was not an effort by the city, but by a private uh, 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 industrialist to build one for industries in Vernon. At this particular point in time, there was a group called Las Madres del Este de Los Angeles, the Mothers of East LA, who had recently formed to fight off a proposed prison for their community. So they had just no longer, they fought the prison and then they turned their efforts over to fighting the incinerator. But they were, of course, assisted by concerned citizens of South Central Los Angeles, which worked very closely with them in terms of strategy, in terms of their own experiences, and what they learned in terms of helping Las Madres go on to also successfully fend off the incinerator. Now, it's important to realize that neither group was cross-racial, all right? Las Madres was all Latina, and concerned citizens was all African American. This was primarily so because of geographic and segregation patterns at the time. There's almost, there were almost no black people living in East LA. And there were Latinos who were just moving into South Central Los Angeles at this time, but uh, they were not you know, well integrated into the community yet and certainly were not part of concerned citizens of South Central Los Angeles. However, by the late 1980s, one of those networks began developing that I had talked about, the Southwest Network for Environmental and Economic Justice, known as the SNEJ. And SNEJ brought together all of these similar kinds of groups from across the Southwest, including native lands. And working together then, as I said, they were able to assist each other, all these different groups, and they became a multiracial group, the Sneej, but not individually, right? But we saw tremendous levels of political consciousness develop, tremendous levels of solidarity, awareness, and appreciation that we saw between various groups of people. In this case, in the Sneej, there was also a lot of indigenous people, given it's the Southwest, um, African American communities, Latino communities, as well as um, some Asian groups as well that were part of, of, of the scene. So I think this is incredibly uh, important looking at these stories about how people learn about racial difference, racial connections, how we can begin to work together, right? These have been really instrumental in this regard. Now, I know I've, gone, I've probably gone way over, so let me just wrap up. 
and um, uh, by way of review, my goal has been to complicate the way we talk about inter-ethnic relations, all right, between particularly African Americans and Latinos. Now, I don't want to dismiss the insights of either those scholars who focus on conflict or those scholars who focus on cooperation, both of whom have really important insights for us to share and to, to, to learn about. Um, very, very important. But I have tried to introduce a third way for us to think about these kinds of things, to begin seeing things a little bit differently, by stressing the way Latinos and African Americans have deeply shaped each other over the last you know, 150 years or, or even more that we are talking about. Um, we shape, them in our, uh, shape each other in our struggles for freedom and for justice, even if we have not always been aware of it. Now, I focus on these moments of overt and conscious political action because I think this is one of our best hopes for transforming the world. I realize and appreciate that not all Latinos and African Americans want to struggle together, and I respect that. <coughs> all right? There is an important need to have individual space and autonomy for people to deal with their own stuff, as it were. But there is a minority that does and is willing to cross those racial and ethnic lines. And that, I think, is what's very important that we support, because that is one of the key ways in which power is being produced. And we desperately need that power to figure out how to challenge white supremacy and neoliberal capitalism at this particular historical moment. Thank you. organizations that you've studied in LA that you would say are integrating these practices of black and brown coming together and having some sort of new 21st century political consciousness? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> what would you say makes those, like what are the, like what makes it so effective and how do those organizations differentiate themselves from other organizations yeah. and why, why might they not be so, why might some people not want to join them mm -hmm. as um, often as they might want to join some other organizations? Mm -hmm. And how do you think that could be changed? So the first part is um, of your question, so with some of these organizations, what, you know, when I think about, for example, the Labor Community Strategy Center, right? And from the very beginning, it was, it's a, we're gonna develop a multiracial, a multiracial left, that was the, the objective, right? And when they actually began bringing different community groups of people together, again, people not necessarily with any levels of political consciousness, it was like, and they had, they had a range, they had many people with different, different levels of consciousness and backgrounds and things like this. But when they started doing the translation, there were some African Americans said, uh-uh, I don't wanna do this. This isn't right, this is like my country, I should not have to be engaging in, it, it was initially just Spanish before they brought in the Korean. And that organization made the decision, all right, well, then we're gonna have to say goodbye. All right, which was a really hard thing to do. But it's like, this is what, if we're gonna be a multiracial organization, there has to be a culture of translation that has to be accepted, right? Um, and so they lost some people that way, but you know, it's gone on to really, to flourish in many kinds of ways with a very large <coughs> African American um, uh, participation. So they, they lost those in those kinds of ways. Um, then you also said about what, why do people, one of the reasons people join these organizations also, there's, uh, is they choose issues, they're issue driven in many ways. So they're choosing issues that will appeal to a cross section of people, all right? So if I wanna make a multiracial organization, I'm not gonna focus just on immigration rights necessarily, all right? <laughs> um, although there have been some multiracial, I don't wanna pretend like they don't exist because they do. But I'm gonna really choose an issue which is more encompassing. I think that's one of the reasons, again, why EJ, environmental justice, becomes more plausible. Um, all people care about breathing clean air, right? Um, especially, you know, poor people, with, they have the worst air oftentimes to breathe. So I think that's another important issue, is issue identification and how you frame the issue, doing it in such a way as to, um, as to uh, build a broad-based constituency in terms of going for it. Now a different kind of example I could talk about is in terms of like organized labor. 
Um, and in organized labor, um, I don't know if any of you guys are aware of this, LA has become like kind of like a ground zero for the rebirth of the labor movement, even as pathetic as it is <laughs> in some ways. And it's been heavily driven by Latinos, all right? Um, for a variety of reasons that we could talk about. But the bottom line is, is that people are saying, you know what, where's the black people in, in labor anymore? They're not here. And because uh, one of their leaders, Marilyn Dorato, again, who's someone who comes out of the UFW, who comes out of other kind of left organizations that were very committed to multiracial politics, she made it a part of her platform and um, agenda as president of the LA County Fed to build particular programs that go out and organize black workers. So she said, well, where are the black people working, right? Security. So they developed a whole campaign about organizing security guards to bring them into the labor movement, all right? Because she did not want to see, lab ha see the labor movement <coughs> fractured along racial lines between African Americans and Latinos. She thought that's just like a no starter, right? Um, how, so let's fix that. So we see yeah, lots of examples of that. I mean, there's still drops in the bucket, but. <laughs> so creating a new political consciousness is essentially identifying certain issues beyond your immediate, um, beyond what immediately affects you that you can. No, not necessarily. Okay, like if it, if it comes like to an environmental justice issue, mm -hmm. and we're, we're again, so that depends on the neighborhood. All right. So if me and you are living in a black and brown community, and we decide to mobilize around clean air, well then everybody is a potential member of that group. Okay. So again, that's another thing to think about is space, geography versus issue, right? Those kinds of things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Someone in the same vein, what, what is the nature of, I guess, uh, local politics in terms of how candidates that may be associated from one, uh, one left-wing group uh, would you know, somewhat relate to other people within the same group in LA, as in uh, the Black Panther Party did face animosity from other groups that identify both as black and also left, or, um, but what, what does that look like today in terms of local politics where a lot of these things, seem, or a lot of left-leaning uh, movements seem to be more powerful? So are you asking me in terms of contemporary period, left movements, how are they, seen by the other group? Uh, yeah, in terms of like running for community positions or oh, you mean uh, electoral local, local politics. politics? Yes, okay, in that okay. sense. Well, okay, so electoral politics, I would say there's nobody in the left running for electoral <laughs> politics. <laughs> but there are progressives and there are, are there. Now, um, you know, we had two elections ago, two election cycles, uh, Antonio de Aragosa, he was elected mayor of Los Angeles. This is very interesting. Um, so he was elected, uh, the first time he ran, I think was in 2000 he ran, and Vera Gosa <coughs> has a very interesting history. He actually comes out of one of those left organizations, um, and, he had d he has, and he also <coughs> comes out of labor. So he actually has a lot of experience with African Americans, and he has done a lot of multiracial organizing in the past, particularly between African Americans and Latinos. So he's running in 2000 against the white guy, uh, James Hahn. Hahn. And James Hahn is a white guy who is the son of a very important white guy who was very in tight with the black community, all right? So he has name recognition, he's got credentials in the black community. So who are African-American people gonna vote for? The Aragosa or Han? They voted for Han, they voted for Han, all right? And I think part of it was like fear, oh God, they're taking over the Mexicans, right? Their, their numbers, because people were talking about that way too. It's the first time a serious, Latino candidate was running in like a century in LA, right? I mean, it was really a big thing. Um, and so there was that level of fear and you know anxiety about, again, displacement, will he address our needs and things like that. And I honestly think uh, Villaragosa would have addressed his needs, right? But they went with Han. Next four years later, Villaragosa runs again. And this time it's very interesting, the demographics are shifting now. And so you're getting a whole other layer, a level of young African Americans who have been in these groups like the Strategy Center. They've been in community coalitions. They've been in these organizations, and they're saying they got a different kind of consciousness. Like, no, we'll go for Via Gosa. Why would we? Hey, let's go for the person of color. Let's go for someone who, in fact, we think will be sensitive to our concerns and has a history of working with the black community as well. And that's how we want, right? So it's both, you know, pulling out the Latino voters as well as the African American voters that gave Villaragosa that second um, election that, that he won. 
So, you know, people say what we really need in LA is a black politician who speaks Spanish. <laughs> you know, and um, I think there's a lot of truth to that. I think, I mean, uh, people want to be very sensitive to the concerns of African Americans as we've seen growing, you know, the explosion of the Latino population over the last like decades. And it's like, you know, black people wonder, where is the space for me in my city, right? It's all changed, the landscape is changing. There's Spanish everywhere, right? And I think those are, you know, legitimate kinds of concerns. And so I think something, a politician like that, who had that kind of sensibility would go a long way towards kind of bridging the population. <coughs> mm -hmm. uh, the divisions of different political organizations, uh, especially in the 1960s and 1970s, um, along sort of racial ethnic lines, do you think that has some sort of, I don't know, historical or cultural origins? Like, for instance, I guess um, in your book you were talking about how, especially post World War II, um, a lot of uh, a lot of ethnic groups had different experiences that kind of created a different sort of political consciousness that they had, mm -hmm. and contributed to the way in which they developed into political organizations like um, the Japanese in Chinatown, with China, with uh, insurgents and um, also. Um, the Hispanic population, especially in terms of immigration, how they, uh, how one of the most well known of the organizations developed out of um, rural, out of uh, rural kind of environment. So, do you think like that could have contributed to like the things that you know we do see today? Oh, um, that's interesting. I mean, they certainly did earlier. I mean, I kind of make that argument, <laughs> but um, I also think that I think that's less so now. I think that's less known. And because, you know, it's particularly when, when you look at political um, political engagement, it is primarily, it's not exclusively, but it's primarily a, a phenomenon of young people, right? It's your people your age who are really taking the lead on this. And we can see that, you know, like in, in Ferguson, right? Um, it's not my generation anymore that, that, is, that is doing that. And when you look at your generation or, you know, people's 20s and their 30s, they're experiencing, like in big cities, I think they're having much more kinds of similar experiences based on class and race, particularly between like Latinos and African Americans, and I think there's lots of similarities. So I, I think those those experiences um, they might still have an important role, but I think I think that, you know living in a city, experiencing neoliberalism, being poor experiencing police violence, those are powerful uniting kinds of, potentially uniting factors, I think, that we can see. That, that is a shared thing that, that, uh, that can bring people together, I think. I also think, you know, when I started doing that book, I thought, well, this is very interesting, this time period and people coming together and how, to the extent that they did. And I subsequently spent a lot more time studying the previous era, like the 40s and 50s, and what I learned is that people actually were coming together probably even more in that time, it's in, at least in the case of, of Los Angeles, as far as all I know. And, um, and I think part of the reason that they were doing it more at the time is they were not engaged in questions of nationalism, which dominates the 60s and 70s. And so even though like the Santa Party, they had you know, allies in all groups and countries around the world, right? these were hardly isolationists or you know, black only with their orientation, but there was a very powerful kind of nationalist ideology. And so there were lines to be drawn still, right? About who could be a member of the Black Panther Party, right? And that kind of stuff. And, and you look at an earlier time, again, these are, even some, of, even some of the radical organizations, there's a lot, those, those, those walls are, are much lower because it's uh, less nationalistic. Mm -hmm. No, I, one of the things that we do know that is uh, in the Bay Area, I think there were, couple of points um, that you mentioned of the, the how do you say, the, the, the exchange between these groups, and particularly I remember uh, the boycott, which is uh -huh. one of the things that, that brought people together. And it also brought, uh, you know, young people uh, out into the valley, into these uh, centers in California where they hadn't really been exposed to um, communities uh, from the, you know, Conditions that were there as well that brought them also out of this, out of their communities, into this other environment. Uh, 
as well as in places like Iberia, t the language is uh, there's a there's a crossover in in, uh, in bilingualism, you might say, in these communities. You know, there's a large segment of, of bilingual uh, members of both communities, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, that's something that's also probably in the future will affect some of these things. But those are the things that I thought about as I, you know, as I come from that environment. One of the things I wanted to ask about was the, the young people, the, the, the people from um, the university communities helping citizens, uh, uh, concerned citizens in, in, oh, wow. in LA. Are there more organized bases of these young people in other university communities or so <coughs> that are linked into these kinds of organizations? There are, but uh, not to the extent um, at this particular program at UCLA, which it's really kind of remarkable. What they did, this was an urban planning program, and they, um, every year, it's a, it's a master's degree program that these students are in, and they have a client. It's a client project. And so the professor had connections with this community, and they said, look at this community is being targeted. For our project, we're going to evaluate this EIR. And that's what they did for a year. And then they produced an alternative EIR, and they had that took to court. I mean, it's, it's an amazing thing, you know. And so, on that scale, it's hard to imagine, you know, other people doing that. But people do smaller things, but not usually on that scale. That was quite remarkable. Um, and I, I thank you so much for bringing up the point about um, in the valley, Central Valley. Um, you know, uh, in, in when you look at the California and you look at the um, those <coughs> moments of solidarity in the valley. They drift in from the Bay. Mm -hmm. They all come from the Bay. A little bit from LA, but it's the Bay Area spillover, I call it. <laughs> of moving into the Bay, absolutely. So that's excellent point, really important. We have time for one more question. Maybe for Jimbo? <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Maybe for, maybe for those who will not be seeing our guests. Um, maybe for those who will not be seeing my guests. <laughs> He's very eager over here. <laughs> He's like, put it in front of If you want to go, go ahead. You won't show up. Can we vote for that? You actually seem like you are ready. No, no, but this is a question. <laughs> Hate to be that person who organizes things, um, but yes. Okay, I'm just wondering, are there multiracial racial groups out there that are fighting women's groups that are fighting the assault on women's rights, especially reproductive rights, an important issue to rally around, mobilize. You okay. know, so my question is related. Okay, to all right, piggyback <laughs> on it, Margo. Let's <laughs> 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 before. Uh huh. There's yeah. Angela Davis, there's Dolores Huerta, and then on the right here, that it looks like oh, yeah. her. Uh -huh. right? And then the slide before. Yes. The, the slogan is Black Panthers, Brown Berets, but they're both women. Uh -huh. And so what's the role of women yeah. and women's issues in the organizing? Thank you. I knew we could work. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is the relational, relational. Right. Uh -huh. right, right. So there's this one group, is it um, Soul Sister? Yep. Yeah, Soul Sister, right? Um, and I don't know, how the, it is somewhat multiracial. I don't know how multiracial it is. Do you know? It's quite multiracial. It is. Uh -huh. And they called out Planned Parenthood Federation of America recently uh, uh, because of a quote in a New York Times article in which some Planned Parenthood leaders were saying, oh yes, you know, we've taken the lead on all, you know, reproductive justice issues and you know, with no mention at oh. all of coalition or anything. Oh, yeah. oh wow, no, yeah. And you know, it's like, if uh, there hasn't been, I think, that much, because in particularly like, you know, there's a long history of like sterilizing Chicanas, Puerto Ricans, and Native women, mm -hmm. and you um and who and black women. and and black women, um, I, I don't see that that kind of those connections I I think being made, but I that is not as I don't have my pulse on that one, mm -hmm. as as directly in, in terms of that, and I know you know as I was putting the slideshow together I said to myself these are so male, <laughs> it really is very heavily male. Um, and I, you know, I, I think about that, like, well, why is that? Those are just the images I got, but I'm thinking more about the movements themselves. And I do think that there tends to be a, a very heavy male presence in some way. And, and again, I, I think this is coming back to civil rights. It's again, going back into those historical kinds of, of predecessor, uh, predecessor organizations. Um, so I don't know that there's been as many women that have taken the lead on this, but that's an excellent question. Yeah. That's, a, that's, a, that's a project. <laughs> 
the they, reason. they may be in the background, right? Right, right. Background. right. But they're always there. Of but course. who gets put out as right. the leader, right. I think, right. is the, and I love these two posters because yeah. I think is that kind great? of represent the women's presence. So, excellent question. Thank you. I'll work on that.